We're looking at a cash management model whose main purpose is to calculate how much and when to distribute capital in order to optimize both equity contributions and equity distributions. In other words, the advantage of this model is that it automatically calculates for us what we should do with each cash flow in terms of how much we should distribute, how much we should save, how we can optimize our contributions, when we should take each of those decisions, how much we have in the bank account at each period, how much has been saved and will be saved into the bank account, and how much has been taken from and will be taken from the bank account. At the end of the day, the main takeaway is that we don't want to start making equity distributions unless we're 100% sure that we won't be contributing anymore. Otherwise, several issues arise. Issue number one, we increase the deal's equity risk because strictly speaking, we can never be sure that the investors will still have that cash lying around months after we had already distributed. Issue number two, we overinflate the IRR and therefore the promoted interest because if we distribute too early just to end up contributing right after, the IRR is artificially inflated. This happens because the following contributions are not enough to offset the fake IRR boost generated by those premature distributions. And this happens because of the time value of money concept, which says that money today is worth more than money tomorrow. Issue number three, we fall into cash flow redundancies because we are distributing capital just to request it back from investors soon after, which damages our reputation because investors cannot ever be completely sure that the distributions we make will remain so or whether soon we'll just end up requesting those distributions back again in the form of additional contributions. And issue number four, we may be seen as unprofessional fund managers who lack basic cash management skills, who are incapable of delivering steady coupon-like dividends, and who rely on cheap tactics to clear IRR hurdles and therefore performance fees. This cash management model is therefore meant to be applied right before we run our distribution waterfall models, meaning right before we proceed to split cash flows between limited and general partners. If I paste or link my non-adjusted free cash flow to equity here, like this, and then turn this model on with this switch here, I'll be able to see the effect it creates on the cash flows. As we can see, equity contributions and distributions are no longer interspersed, but rather optimized and separated from each other. If we assume a literal interpretation of the non-adjusted cash flows, we can see that this distribution event, represented by this dark gray bar here, actually takes place at this point in time. The problem is that the following two periods, if we take literally what the cash flows are saying, we see that we make two additional equity contributions here, which in real life really does doesn't make any sense because if we distribute capital in a certain period, it is not just so that we can raise that capital and inject it again back into the venture during the following couple periods. If we did that, investors would think that we don't know how to manage cash properly, as these are basic skills of any serious and qualified fund manager or general partner. But when this cash management model is on, then we can see how both equity contributions and distributions are optimized. In other words, we know exactly how much and when we should distribute capital. Optimizing equity distributions against equity contributions is important because we want to minimize liquidity risks, IRR inaccuracies, and cash flow redundancies, while making sure that the equity requirement that we communicate is sufficient and correct from the beginning. Since calculating peak equity is relatively easy, we might know it from the beginning of the investment analysis phase without much of a problem. In this case, it is $75.6 million. However, peak equity is assuming a perfect optimization of contributions against this distributions. But peak equity doesn't tell us how we can get there in real life. It does not tell us how much we should distribute nor how much we should save every time our deal makes a profit in order to reach that perfectly optimized peak. Let us think of peak equity as the outstanding equity at its lowest point, which in this case we can find here in period 58 at $75.6 million, which is the same metric reported over here. If we take the non-adjusted free cash flow to equity literally, which we shouldn't, we should always optimize it first, and that is precisely the purpose of this model, we can see that the total calculated equity requirement is $106.5 million, which is equal to the sum of every single light grade negative bar here, meaning the sum of every single equity contribution. Let us think of equity requirement as the total equity that we would need to inject into the joint venture throughout the venture's life. However, we know that this one 
106.5 million dollars cannot be right because the number is higher than peak equity which doesn't make sense because of course we're going to use these profits over here to finance the losses that follow them otherwise we would be implying that we would distribute just to contribute the following month which as we already mentioned previously would be considered as a cash management inefficiency as the flows become redundant in other words the difference between 106.5 million and 75.6 million is 30.9 million dollars those 30.9 million dollars is the amount of money that we would need to know how to manage in terms of offsetting distributions against contributions in order to match that perfectly optimized peak equity calculation at 75.6 million and that is why having an automatic model that can do those calculations for us is important as opposed to us having to do those calculations by hand for every deal and for every different scenario of each deal. This cash management model has the following sections. First of all, this is the non-adjusted free cash flow to equity, meaning the mainstream of cash flows that we're going to fit into this model. And this is the adjusted free cash flow to equity, meaning the main output of this model. If we wanted to override the suggested distributions that this model calculates, we may do so over here. For example, in period 59, if instead of distributing $3.1 million out of the initial profit of $3.6 million, we just wanted to distribute a rounded number such as say $3 million, we just type here $3 million and the remainder will go into the cash account. So the actual distribution will be the $3 million with which we overrode the suggested distribution of $3.1 million dollars. The bank account is over here with its balance at the beginning of the period, balance at the end of the period, additions, drawdowns and redistributions at exit. Here we can see the delta between the non-adjusted and the adjusted cash flows. In other words, the actual cash management effect represented by cash adjustments which in the aggregate should always add up to zero. Over here we have the drivers of the cash management model. First we have a toggle to turn this model on and off. Then we have the rolling horizon indicating the number of periods that this model can analyze into the the future on a rolling basis in order to optimize the contributions and distributions. For example, if we indicate a two-period horizon instead of a six-period horizon, we see that now we have a horizon insufficiency error here. To spot the error, we just look at the graph and see those errors appear here in periods 26, 35, 44, and 53. Basically, there's no reason to distribute just to contribute a couple months later. So by gradually increasing the horizon, we can find the sweet spot where no contribution will follow a distribution. So three periods is not enough either, four periods is not enough, five periods is still not enough, and with a six period analysis horizon we are finally able to manage the cash properly. We also have a minimum cash balance input here in order to indicate the minimum amount of money that we would like to save and keep in the bank account. For example, let us paste a simpler cash flow stream just for easier visualization purposes. In this case we can see that without a minimum cash balance the cash management model simply saves the $20,000 that will be needed a couple periods into the future. However, if we indicate that we will want say a $5,000 minimum cash balance Balance, then the cash manager will save those additional $5,000 here. If we say that we want to have a $10,000 minimum cash balance, then the cash manager will not only save all the profits from the second period, but also take $5,000 additional dollars from the third period. If we say that we want to have a $50,000 minimum cash balance, then the cash manager won't be able to optimize the losses in periods 4 and 5, and we will have to actually cover those losses with equity contributions as indicated here. If we say that we want to have a $60,000 minimum cash balance, then the cash manager is simply never able to attain that balance as the cash flow simply do not give enough resources for the model to do its job. Then for rounding purposes we have a decimal places tolerance input here, which ends up fine-tuning these booleans here so that we can be certain that the model does not report any non-existent errors. And here we can choose the currency symbols we want to use. We have included a dollar sign, a pound sign, a euro sign, and a Swiss franc sign, based on the currencies that most of our clients use. But we may add any other symbol we want by simply expanding this list over here and pasting another currency symbol. Here we have a little summary telling us that the model is error-free. Finally here we have a graph that maps out the cash flows in terms of contributions, distributions and outstanding equity. We can see outstanding equity in the left axis or in the right axis by simply clicking on the graph, then on chart design, then on chain chart type and ticking or unticking this box here. In its simplest form, what would the typical structure of a cash flow be? 
In its simplest form, we would first expect to see operating and capital flows, which would lead us to the unlevered cash flow. We would then expect to see leverage related flows, such as drawdowns, payments, payoffs, interest, and fees, and that would lead us to the levered cash flow. We would then usually see outflows related to taxes, and most times this is what we would refer as the non cash adjusted free cash flow to equity. What most people do is that they then proceed to split that stream of cash flows between LPs and GPs. However, as we've already seen in this presentation, before proceeding to do so, we should first make the necessary cash adjustments to optimize our cash flows. And this is where our cash management model fits in so that we can finally, number one, get to our cash adjusted free cash flow to equity line, simply referred to here as free cash flow to equity. Number two, run our waterfall model. And number three, split those cash flows among LPs and GPs. To plug this cash management model into our financial models, we first copy and paste as values into the cash management model the non-adjusted free cash flow to equity line, which is in the financial model cash flow. We do so from the first column to the last, including those columns that are beyond the current holding period, but that are part of the financial model timeline, even if those cells are equal to zero. Then we transfer as a copy the whole cash management model worksheet into the financial model. Now we can actually link the non-adjusted free cash flow to equity line, the whole timeline, not just the current holding period, to the newly transferred cash management model. We change the font color of the recently linked cells to indicate that these values come from another worksheet as opposed to being hard coded. And finally, we link the cash adjusted free cash flow to equity line from the cash management model worksheet into the financial models cash flow. This adjusted stream of cash flows are the ones to be later input into a distribution waterfall model in order to split the profits between limited partners and general partners.